Ladies and gentlemen, we stand at a watershed moment in humanity's vast, digital, uncertain future. A potent technology, artificial intelligence, has been developing with breathtaking speed, thanks in large part to advances in neural network technologies that are roughly modeled after the human brain. AI is able to ascertain patterns in massive, unstructured data sets, make recommendations, even make decisions, with ever-increasing precision because it learns by itself without the interference of messy, complicated, emotional human beings. Fascinating and scary at the same time, isn't it? This is why I think we need to ask ourselves this fundamental, critical question for humankind. How will we shape and govern the power of AI so that it serves human values and human power? This man here, as I'm sure you'll agree, knows a fair bit about power, for better or for worse. And apparently he knows about the combination of artificial intelligence and power. This is hot off the press. He's quoted in a meeting just last week with young AI leaders as saying, those who lead in the development of AI will end up ruling the world. I hate to tell you, in this particular instance, he may be on to something. Because AI is about power. It's about the power of the technology and how it relates to and interferes with human power and the power of societal institutions. That is why we need to get in ahead of this and make sense of it before the machine that we created, the technology, runs circles around us faster than we can count the laps. Let me back up and talk about a person that is closer to me than Mr. Putin, luckily. This is my daughter, Hannah. She's 12. Let me ask you, hands up if you have children. Thank you. I'm glad we're not suffering from any extinction problems in this room. <laughs> children are great. They make you think about the future. Your children, my children, will live in a world that is pervasively permeated by artificial intelligence. This is not science fiction. This is not some unbelievable future. This is starting right now. Hannah is starting to play rich computer games, providing information about herself, her cognitive patterns, her behavior, social, competitive, potentially even her socioeconomic status and that of her family as we're starting to pay for games. In a few years, she'll be driving a car or she'll be driven in an autonomous car and she will be providing information about herself to automakers and insurance companies about her risk profile, about her geographic movement patterns, thanks to GPS and AI coming together, about her social and emotional needs as she communes in the car with other people, and as she draws content, games, music, from the web into the car. The machine, the AI, will then mesh all of this and draw conclusions on her, quote unquote, pattern of life her pattern of life. It will then make predictions about what Hannah might want to do or need to do next. Tremendously useful, of course, and also problematic. Let me project forward to, let's say, I don't know, 2030. Hannah goes to the doctor. There's a medical AI assisting the doctor. The AI will be able to look at disparate data streams, such as her nutritional intake and food preferences, her family history and DNA. Uh, the geographic area she lives in and what the pollution levels are there, uh, even stress levels in her relationships and at work. And it will be able to make a prediction about Hannah's likelihood of incurring breast cancer at some point in the medium term future. Now, right about now, you might say, but that's fantastic. She now has choices that you and I never had. And that may be so, unless, of course, the machine says, the AI says, Hannah, you're going to have to follow my recommendations for drastic changes in your lifestyle if you want to stay insured. Now, I don't know about you, but I think this should be Hannah's choice. It should be driven by Hannah's value set. I may have my preferences for Hannah's well-being, but this is her as a person calling these shots privately, I might add. So we need to make sure that she retains the right to self-determination on these critical questions. Let me talk a little bit more about values because values are at the core of how we as human beings are empowered. In society, you might think we transact commercially or in social media and give a fairly holistic picture of who we are. 
But that's not true. It's a very partial picture. You have dormant values. You have emergent values. Your values change as you stumble through life serendipitously, meeting people, meeting challenges, feeling failure and, and success, pain and joy. You evolve and so does your value system. You make hairline thin trade-offs between values every day. Now, this complicated picture needs to be included in the governance of AI, maybe even your personal assistant AI. Now, not to make things too complicated, on top of this, society also has an interest in this and has its own hierarchy of values. How will that hierarchy, expressed in political processes and community, conflict with your value hierarchy as you jointly govern the AI? Let me give you an example. It's called the Somalia problem. What if all of a sudden your personal AI will tell you, I'm sorry boss, but I'm gonna have to go to Somalia because our government has summoned us to go help with a humanitarian crisis. And then you say to the AI, let's call him George, George, you can't leave. I need you here in say California to help me manage our water problems. I'm sorry, boss, but um, starving children, more important than water in California. But George, uh, we've got mm, sunshine and marijuana here. And, and it says, <laughs> dude, I'm a software program. And off it goes to Somalia, right? So, so who determines what values govern AI? That's a critical question. Let me talk a little bit more about values. Who here has had a run-in with the law? I'm sorry, you can't answer this because we're on camera. But... Let me ask you then, who here has seen the movie Minority Report, right? Great movie, science fiction, but it isn't. It's actually here now. It's called predictive policing. The NYPD is working with big data companies to get predictions on where in the city crime might arise, and then they can preemptively dispatch officers to those locations. Now, right about now, you might feel a lot safer as a tourist going to New York. But the communities in question feel stigmatized. And they're asking the NYPD, how did your machine arrive at these conclusions? And the machine can't tell them that. Similarly, some judges in America are getting assistance from machine learning algorithms, AI, on determining bail payments for alleged offenders. And yet the machines can't tell the judges how they arrived at these conclusions. Now, I think that's a problem in a society that's governed by the transparent rule of law. And because of that, the U.S. government, represented by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, that's a mouthful, uh, has launched a program called Explainable AI. So they're using one AI to explain another AI, right? Now, we have, remember this, we have layers upon layers upon layers of values and layers upon layers upon layers of AI. Who is going to govern all of this transparently, right? It's a big issue for us to solve. I want to go from policing to psychology. 45 million Americans have some kind of psychological trouble or another. And yes, that's gotten worse since the election. I'm sorry to say. 80% of them don't think they can get adequate, accessible, uh, inexpensive care. In come the psychotherapy bots. Eliza, Ellie, Wubot, and Sim Sensei. Some of these are developed by uh, uh, medical experts and the military in order to provide relief to soldiers who are suffering from trauma, depression, increased stress levels, right? Great service to them. But we need to be conscious that this kind of technology is now permeating other areas of life. Who here has uh, interviewed for a job, let's say over the last five years, right? Some of you, a lot of you in fact, that tells me you know how anxiety evoking that is. This kind of technology here, facial recognition, voice recognition, body language recognition algorithms, are comparing you, analyzing you in your interview performance against that of other interviewees. Then they're using that to compare all the interviewees to other people on the inside of the company who have already been performing well on these jobs. Now, they want to predict how well you can do in these jobs. Understandable. But uncanny, isn't it? Because you thought you were in control of your own appearance. So we need to talk about this. I want to go to the political realm now and think big. China is spending billions of dollars on AI to assign a trust rating to each one of its citizens, a publicly available rating. Why are they doing this? 
they want to facilitate peace and harmony for the glorious harmony society to increase uh, peaceful transactions in the economy. Understandable, given China's history, but also scary. Why? Who's in charge of these ratings? How, what kind of recourse does a citizen have to correct misunderstandings or mistakes? And by the way, aren't we always told we should learn from mistakes? So then, are we going to get a bonus to make up for some shortcoming on a mistake? How is all this going to be determined? This has a direct impact on the power to determine the livelihood of a billion five Chinese, right? A big thing. I want to highlight that there is a lot of benefit to a lot of the things that I just told you. I'm a techno-optimist. I want to show you some other things that are unequivocally positive. This is what I might call the social factory in Germany. These are experiments where the machine is learning basic parameters, physical, psychological, about the human operator here on the left, then integrating with that operator more effectively for more collaborative, higher productivity. That is great for economic growth and for labor, right? You might have heard about Japan's aging society. 25% of Japan's population is 65 years or older. They're facing a looming crisis of a million caregivers, uh, a shortage of a million caregivers by 2025. Therefore, Japan has invested in robots and in AI to facilitate longer, healthier, less lonely lives for its elderly, right? I think that's a phenomenal idea. I have an aging parent on another continent. I would love to call up the AI, let's call him George, right, and ask, hey George, how is, how is mom doing, right? And get an objective opinion on how she's doing day or night, instead of getting her on the phone saying, oh honey, don't worry about me, I'm fine, right? You want that authenticity. Now, so therefore, I think that's a great thing. Climate change and AI, possibly the biggest impact, positively speaking, for all of mankind, humankind. We have AI working with the UN IPCC, the body that won the Nobel Prize for its climate change research and activism, determining which of its climate change models are the most effective. That will impact all of Earth. It doesn't get any bigger than this, does it? Now, you might ask, where is all of this going to go in the future? And there are four emerging perspectives I leave you with. The first one is the upper left, essentially saying that a lot of people who are inventing AI or innovating on it are introverted people, right? That uh, frankly don't care very much about human irrationality, ambiguity, ambivalence, political decisions. It's messy. Put them all on a couch, let the machine run the world, right? The second version is a much bleaker version of this which is that the machine, the AI, will eventually eradicate us. Why? Because either it has figured out that we are a non-optimizable function in this world, or because some evil uh, doer is going to hijack it and kill all of us. Okay? This is Mr. Hawking or Mr. Musk's version of the future. The third perspective is uh, that uh, of the singularity, the machine, the AI, and the human essentially becoming one, right? This is Ray, Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil's uh, version. And I suppose that means we don't have to be afraid of AI because we're going to become one with it, okay? The fourth perspective is that we need to keep the human being understood by the machine, observed by the machine, in the center of the machine's attention, always in control and empowered. The best, uh, the best representation, I think, of this perspective is Stuart Russell and the uh, Center for Human Compatible AI at UC Berkeley. This, ladies and gentlemen, I think is our ticket. That's our path. We need to go from the upper left to the lower right, bypassing the upper right here in this picture altogether. How do we get there? We need to do something that we're not usually very good at which is learn from history. Go back 800 years. King John, returning from France to England, faced with 20-odd angry barons saying, we no longer want your intransparent rule. They sat down together, and eventually the Magna Carta came out of it. The Magna Carta was a quasi-contractual document that was the precursor to the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and eventually constitutional democracy. I think we need a new Magna Carta, a digital Magna Carta for the era of AI. And that document needs to put values-based, 
human empowerment at the center. Let me say this again because it's important. Values-based human empowerment. We have to get there through a multi-stakeholder global congress. This needs to be a forum for where all of us and our children can be represented, not just the experts and policymakers. Right? If we can get this done, then I think I will sleep much better, and I would submit to you, you will sleep much better too, knowing that our children will live the kinds of lives that are worth living. Thank you very much.